So welcome everybody to our October lunchtime webinar for the Centre for Research Excellence in Strengthening Systems for Healthcare Equity, Indigenous Health Equity. I'm Alison Laycock and I'm the Research Translation and Capacity Strengthening Fellow for CRE Stride. And today we're going to be talking about the important work of the Action 2 Aboriginal Kidney Care Research Project. Um, so welcome all. But before I introduce Rani and Kim, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we're meeting today. I'm working and living in Ghana country in South Australia and acknowledge and pay respects to the Ghana people and to the Wijibal Wyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation where the CRE is based in Northern New South Wales. We recognise the continuing connection to land and waters and culture of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and pay respect to the people and the elders past, present and in the future. And I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are amongst us today. So I'd like to introduce our presenters, Rani Lester and Kim O'Donnell. I'll just share a little bit of information about Rani and Kim. Rani is a First Nations woman belonging to the Andiamatana people of the Northern Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Her parents, her mother's parents are Andiamatana and her father's parents are Welsh and Tamil Indian. And Rani grew up heavily influenced by the guidance of her Andiamatana culture and is proud to say she's from different cultural backgrounds. Growing up in a Christian family, Rani grew up with a spiritual presence within her life, both from an Aboriginal and Western Christian perspective and draws strength from both belief systems that keep her grounded as she navigates her way through life. In 2004, Rani was diagnosed with end-stage renal failure requiring dialysis and received a kidney from her father. In 2013, the kidney transplant rejected and Rani was back on dialysis for seven years until October 2020, when she underwent her second kidney transplant and this time from a deceased donor. Rani now uses her lived experience as a renal patient, expert and advocate guide um, to guide and inform better clinical practice in Aboriginal kidney care. So Rani is an inspiring leader and role model in the communities that she lives and works across. Thanks for joining us, Rani. Dr. Kim O'Donnell is a mother and public health researcher who's lived and worked on Ghana country in Adelaide for over 20 years. Kim has returned to country regularly from childhood. She's, a strong, she's strong in her identity as a Malingapa Barkindji woman from lands in Western New South Wales. Um, Kim graduated in 1985 as a primary school teacher. She lived and worked in the Northern Territory, or sort of, yeah, taught in the Northern Territory, mostly at Pepmanati, and taught in Dubbo, New South Wales as well. And Kim has also taught English in Japan. And she's taught jewellery making and started her own business called Namaku Jewellery that some of you may know of. In the 1990s, Kim moved back to Darwin and became a flight attendant for the next eight years. And in this role, she did refugee charter flights into Dili during the Timorese people's fight for self-determination from Indonesia and late night flights into Irianjaya to the Tamaka gold mine. Kim moved to Adelaide from Darwin in 2000, where she went back to university and completed her master and doctorate degree in public health. Kim was a leader in driving the completion of the Mutawinchi Plan of Management, which is a key document to progressing Mutawinchi lands. She chaired the Mutawinchi Local Aboriginal Land Council Board from 2015 to 2019. Kim's worked on the Recognise campaign as a national field leader to raise awareness around the principles of constitutional reform. And she also led, uh, co-led health policy and systems research at the Lowest Institute. So Kim's an internationally recognised researcher in Aboriginal health and wellbeing and she leads action, co-leads Action 2 Kidney Healthcare Project in South Australia. So I'm going to hand over to Rani and Kim now to present and have a yarn about your work. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but Kim and Rani have said they're happy to expand on things as they go through. But can I just remind you, please, to stay on mute if you're not talking. Okay, thanks. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Glad you could join us. So um, as our introductory went, I'm Rani, this is Kim, and we're here today, today to talk about action kidney care, hearing from the experts in action. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start by introducing our message stick or our talking stick. And um, this is specially made for us by 
No, I don't even remember that lady's name. I'm terrible at remembering. A her wonderful name. artist. I can't remember her name too, but we were next time um, in uh, Wollonga. She made seven, seven, seven of these matchy sticks for us. So this one was made for the action reference team. Hmm. So when we come together, um, we first do a spirit check um, with each other, and uh, and we also use uh, these message sticks in um, other um, uh, Indigenous reference groups. Um, that Kelly Owen, another colleague, uh, runs and, and um, works with others. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to thank I'd like to thank Alison uh, and Kieran for this opportunity and that wonderful introduction. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got the message stick, so take it away, Miss Rani. All right. Nanga, name it Rani na. Natu yura mechi uchu onakana. Natu adma yura tu. Natu yata uchu Flinders Rangers yata. Hi, my name is Rani. My Adimatna name is Onakana, which means third born child or daughter who's female. Um, and my ancestral ties are with the Adimatna people of the Northern, Northern Flinders Ranges in South Australia. My moiety or skin group in Adimatna is Aradi, uh, which means North Wind. So we have two, North Wind and South Wind, Aradi and Matri. And it's important to know this because it helps me to understand how I relate to my family, other people, community, creation, and all other living things within. I'd like to start by paying my respects to the past, present, and future Ghana people of Tandanyanga, place of the Red Kangaroo. In acknowledging the Ghana people, we are reminded that this place was cared for and tended to by families of strong men, strong women, and strong children under the guidance and wisdom of our elders, and are reminded of the intimate and deep connection that the Ghana people and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples living within Australia have with our creative spirits. I'd like to also start this conversation and this presentation by paying one minute silence to our brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, nanas, poppers who have lost their battle to kidney, kidney disease. So we'd like to honour them with a one minute silence. So our first slide takes us to the overview of our action project. And um, so I'll be talking about the action one project outcomes, uh, how we came together, how we found ways of working together and uh, how we continue to um, work together and what action has actually like meant to me as a patient um, becoming an expert and being acknowledged as an expert for my lived experience and um, yeah, how we continue to be given space and opportunity and a platform to share our stories and speak about um, our ways of knowing, being and doing and how that's now being, um, how our voices are being brought to the forefront and being highlighted in terms of like what we have to go through, the challenges that we face, being renal patients, um, and not even just for us as renal patients, but for support that we have around us. I'm gonna talk about how action one helped us to transition into action two and the work that was done within action one um, really turned into, I think first it started as a space and then it just turned into this movement because of all the stories that were being shared in this space. And um, from the picture there, that's one of our first pictures that we took of our action members. 
And um, we started originally with 10 action members and um, that were just invited up by um, Janet, Janet Kelly and Kim O'Donnell in their, I guess in their roles that they held, they were, it just, I felt like it all just started with connections and how, and all the different people that we was connected to um, just through our family connections, our community connections and the spaces that we worked and how we uh, created that space to be able to um, come up with the, the things that we value and the challenges that we wanted to get through. So um, a lot of the work that we did within Action actually helped to identify gaps and challenges that we were facing. And then in turn, it uh, informed how we saw ourselves in that space and the cultural safety that needed to happen within the health system and how the health system was actually failing us. So the, impl uh, the impact that action has made has caused um, practices and policies to improve. Well, I've seen them improved with the work that we've done in action and, and how it's changed the SA health system that we're in now. So, um, thank you, Rani. <laughs> uh, so I'll just give you some background um, on Action One. So this was a project that, um, that um, really put Aboriginal people with lived experience of kidney disease at the forefront. Um, and it, it, it happened, uh, it was funded in uh, 2018, and um, so it, it came together through clinicians and researchers who identified issues within the health system, and it gave their commitment to improving the health of Aboriginal people with renal disease. Um, they wanted to create changes because they could see that things within the system wasn't working um, and the importance of developing a culturally responsive health system that looked after and provided culturally safe care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, particularly in trying to access um, access um, um, uh, assistance to, to transplants down the track and what that process may look like. And it was also about promoting Aboriginal community health and wellbeing. Um, but what they found was there was no formal Aboriginal community consultation that had occurred mm -hmm. Uh, prior to this. So they realised, well, well, we need to be talking with Aboriginal people and really putting at the forefront uh, Aboriginal people's voices, particularly patients um, with lived experiences. And so in 2018, a group of staff from Adelaide Nursing School, Kidney Health Australia, South Australian Medical Research Institute and the Central and Northern Renal and Transplantation Service at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, Work together with renal patients to facilitate then um, an Aboriginal kidney care workshop at Kangawadley. And Kangawadley was suggested by the patients themselves because Kangawadley is an Aboriginal managed hostel. And when we when we look at Kangawadley, it, the, the building is centered around a big fire. Mm -hmm. um, the space, it, people feel safe when they go there. Um, and so that was where the first uh, workshop was, was, um, was had. Um, participants included Aboriginal renal patients, family members, other Kangawadley patient and family residents, um, and also uh, participants and family members and carers from Ernabella, Indalkana, Campi, Fregon, and Tuchinjata communities. So um, Action One um, uh, estab established uh, the action reference team. So as a result of those formal um, or that consultation at Kangawadley, it was, it said we need, a, we need a, um, a reference team. We need to bring together Aboriginal people with lived experiences of renal failure. Um, and so the action reference group was, um, was established. That's around the time I came on board to support and um, play a bit of a secretariat role uh, at that time with my colleague, um, Dr. Janet Kelly, who was able to access funding through MRFF funding. So, uh, and also that was auspiced through um, Health Translation SA. So we established the Action Reference Group and that came together primarily from the relational networks um, that some of the kidney nurses had, 
the nephrologist kidney doctors um, through Janet's connections also with cl other clinicians through um, my connection. So the importance of with the relational networks um, really was a catalyst, I think, in bringing the team together. We had three community consultations at Adelaide, Port Augusta, Sejuna, um, and from those three consultations, uh, the reports, we had reports that were, were written and they informed the inaugural National Indigenous Kidney Care Clinical Guidelines um, because there wasn't any um, in terms of um, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So then uh, the patient journey mapping um, uh, happened and the patient journey mapping tools were developed um, in 2008 from Managing Two Worlds Together. And that was also um, a project that was um, supported and funded by the Lowell Institute. And uh, so from those patient journey mapping tools, um, uh, we're able to map uh, each reference uh, team member's stories um, from when they leave home to uh, access through this, the healthcare system um, and then back home again. So from those tools, you're able to then see where the gaps were in service delivery. And sometimes some of those gaps might just be um, a communication gap, you know, um, language barriers, um, but also, um, um, you know, people have experienced um, race, racism uh, and what felt like racism to them um, by individual healthcare members, mm -hmm. you know, say. So, um, so those ma those um, patient journey mapping tools now have been um, they've been redesigned, and that's also another piece of work uh, that we did from uh, with the Lowell Institute. Uh, we've had two annual key stakeholder workshops. In one, the first one was in 2019, and then again in 2020. And what was identified from those workshops uh, with our stakeholders was the uh, the um, the issues with accommodation and transport, which we all knew, we everyone was mm -hmm. talking about it, but it was actually formalised, and um, um, uh, and so they were they were the two areas that we focused on. I think in action one, uh, we also were able to change and influence um, the model of care. So now we have dialysis um, mm -hmm. at Kangawadley. So because people. It was difficult, it's very difficult accessing the healthcare system through the through the hospitals. It's a bit, a bit like a minefield. If um, and so people were feeling really comfortable to, to go and have dialysis at Kangawadley. So there were two chairs set up there which are currently uh, being evaluated. So some of our members also sit on the evaluation team for that. Mm -hmm. Um and that's due to um that's going to be expanded soon. So We've done a lot, haven't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've some good outcomes. We covered a lot. Mm. Yeah. Am I doing the right thing here? How come oh. it's not moving to the portal? Just a slight technicality. Oh, we got stuck here. Oh, there we go. Here we go. So, did you want to talk to this or you have? Yeah. Oh, outcomes? well, just um, some of the action one outcomes, uh, which Kim's talked about as well as the update of patient journey mapping tools that was developed, as she said, um, but it's really helped to tell stories in a clear way to see um, where the patient started, what has been the challenges along the way, and what outcomes and help and support they've received as well, and the different interactions they've had along the way with the services. So it really highlights the good experiences they've had and the bad experiences they've had, and how we need to get all their experiences in the green so that it can be a good experience for them. Um, the cultural bias and policy report, which is yet to be published. Um, a lot of work and words and stories captured in that have come from the action, action group and the action project. And um, we hear these, we hear stories all the time of um, our mob being just being treated poorly or treated unfairly and how that impacts uh, how they access services mm -hmm. and even their willingness to come back and access the service. So we want our people to be accessing the services so that it's safe. And but in the cultural bias um, and policy reports that we we did, um, um, we we also looked at the literature that were have, have got people and um, groups that have worked in this space to improve um, the models of care for renal patients across across the country. And we used the literature of programs that were evaluated. 
Um, and so that that report, we're, we're actually waiting for that to be uh, published uh, because that's got a lot of rich knowledge and which which came from the stories also from another colleague, mm. um, Kelly Owen, who is the National Engagement Coordinator for the National Indigenous Transplantation Task Force. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to when that uh, bias, that cultural bias report and policy report comes out because we we are hoping that that's going to influence the Commonwealth mm. Government um, uh, to work, I guess, um, mm. much better uh, in yeah. this space and, and to support and walk alongside people who know mm. about their bodies and people who've experienced the system. We know, the experts. Um, yeah. The experts. Yeah. And then in December 2020, so last year, um, Janet and I and um, amazing um, researchers and clinicians and doctors that have worked and know patients um, for a long, long time, um, we came together and we had a crack at applying for the Ideas Grant. It was a five-year funded grant and um, and the Ideas Grant, and we thought, well, that's this, let's let's flip this Smarty. and let's let's look at power and let's look at control and shifting um, shifting things around a bit to, to so that we were able to have more influence in terms of indigenous governance, mm. but also um, to really flip it on its head. So we we worked um, really really hard to put in that report um, with the support of uh, our colleagues, um, Dr Tamara McKean, um, Dr Odette Pearson. Uh, um, Shilpa, um, Stephen McDonald. So um, we were so we were. It was an amazing thing because the funding for Action One was only a twelve-month funded project. Um, you can't really achieve much in in twelve months, but we had a good crack, and I think we've done really really well. Uh, and so with um, the impact of COVID, also, um, but that project was extended, um, but it didn't necessarily come with you know extra funds. So mm -hmm. we had to. Um, Really manage um, what we were doing there, and um, but it worked. And so we we got uh, we got a phone call, or we got the email uh, in December. I think it was around the fifth of December. And had to keep it hush hush. Last year we had to keep it hush hush, you know, because it hadn't gone out uh, in the media. And oh my god, I think the first thing I, I just cried. Mm. I um, yeah, I was overwhelmed. So it just meant that we can continue this work for the next five years. And I think as a as a patient expert in this space as well to have that to have the work that we've done over the last 12 months being acknowledged and further supported through this kind of funding for me that was like a oh you know people are listening to it. people are seeing it. we're being seen we're being heard mm -hmm. and our voice like we as human beings are being taken seriously so like we I feel valued now in this space and it all comes back to that you know supporting strong Indigenous governments and gov governments self-empowerment, self-determination. So you're sitting at our table now. Mm. So that's the flipping of the head that we're talking about. So we're not sitting at the table of the decision makers. We created our own table or our own campfire and we sitting at the campfire and we're inviting people to join us to sit there to see how we're doing it, to see our ways of knowing, being and doing. Mm. Yeah. So then this leads us into our uh, research team journey map, um, which Janet and Kelly had a lot of fun in creating and putting together and trying to figure out how it's going to look and um, without confusing everybody. And this is basically a snapshot of like who are the people involved in action, what some of our values and our, our main um, areas of focus are, the people that we're connecting in with and building relationships with, and then how it all transitions into action two. Mm. So in this slide, um, we've highlighted this, um, this relation, building relationships and trust section, which I'll talk about. And, you know, action one for us has been a brave space, um, uh, a space where we get to come together, feel safe, be supported. Um, as renal patients, uh, we get to share our experiences, not even just for us as patients, but the people supporting us. So we've got carers of part of the team and um, families that come along that have been there with our journey through the health system. So it's to lead and have discussions to unpack at a deeper level what's happening in, in kidney journeys in general, individually with our lived experience and what we wanted to change. And so we started to, by building 
on the elevated work already done in the renal space and the outcomes being the cultural bias and policy reports and just inviting people into this space, all those connections started to just happen um, once they heard the story and connected a dot, it was like, ah, we do work in that area, we can help you. How do we connect with you? So then all these little connections started to happen and we drew on our kidney and relational networks where um, you know we had people that we trusted, we had people that we knew that were sitting at the decision-making table, people starting their journeys, um, clinicians who knew what they were doing and that have worked um, in this space with our people for a long time. Um, but also people that were, you know, willing to take a risk, get uncomfortable and come uh, willing to learn from us. So um, sometimes I've found that we've always had to go into a space, but we've had to physically go into the space. And now, you know, flipping that table again, like we're bringing people into our space where we feel more supported and able to lead the project. So we've identified the need to do better. And um, those working with us have also identified the need to do better in Aboriginal kidney care. Um, people who have been invested in bringing care back into the health system, our renal kidney leaders and staff that we've known, uh, that our patients, our experts have known for the last 10 years. So we've had prior to action one, mm -hmm. we, we were doing things individually as patient experts but we didn't have this whole network that we do now that Action One has provided. It was just us doing our own little trying network, change. trying trying to make small changes mm -hmm. just in our own realities. Um, and that because you know you can only get so far in with that model. Mm -hmm. So Action One has actually provided this really strong foundation, a strong model that's led by us. Like the stories are from us. It's our lived experience, and um, people are invested in it, which, you know, it tells me that they're invested in me as a human being to live a better quality of life, given the cards that I've been dealt with in life being kidney failure. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a pretty important space for us to be in. Um, yeah, so it, this is, for me, it's been really interesting mapping where Action One has come from and um, how it's uh, influenced and um, it, the ways we're working into Action Two. Um, so on the on the left hand side, you'll see um, these were our stakeholders in Action One. Um, so we worked um, quite closely with um, SAMRI, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, National Indigenous Kidney Transplant uh, Transplant Task Force. Aboriginal Health Service, Kidney Health Australia, so Purple House. Um, we've also made wonderful connections with the reference um, teams up in Darwin uh, and Alice Springs. Um, and so, um, so shifting into action two, which is a highlighted area there, um, we wanted to, we, we, we had lots and lots of circular discussions around the importance of collaboration and what, what did that look like in practice and then how do we make our voices heard mm -hmm. you know and how do we raise the voices of our of our patient experts and families and so um you know we work with the story of gamma the knowledge sharing um and that was a beautiful concept um from the yonu people in northern territory and i've been working with that concept for quite some time since about 2004 or five um, and then we're also working with the concept around Dadiri, you know, which is a deep listening from the Nangi Kurungu people around Daly River, which is interesting because that's where I, I first taught when I, you know, straight mm -hmm. out of university when I was about 21, 22. Um, and so these were wonderful, you know, really deep, deep um, First Nation concepts. And then yarning, you know, to have that relaxed conversation, which is what we've, we want to do here. Um, is to be able to well, bring the formal, formal and informal together. Um, and that's in that intercultural space or that crossover, the inter interface we were calling it. So we're calling it the interface um, and working in brave spaces because from with, when people work in this space, there is a, there are, um, if you're willing to learn, you, 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 there will be many times when you're feeling vulnerable um, and and then it's sort of it's more around how do we support each other in that in those ways too. But we wanted to um, combine indigenous and Western concepts um, and then to co-design a culturally safe model of care for renal patients. Um, and we wanted to bring back collective decision making, 
Um, and this is a participatory action research project because we ensure that we come always come back to the reference team. Mm -hmm. We always loop back to our research team. We always we loop back to our action project team um, and, so, and our stakeholders. Uh, and so that's really important and, and um, based on look and listen, think and discuss and, and taking action together. Um, and then we want to sort of mix it with sometimes, you know, interviews, focus groups, surveys, evaluation, and then the critical reflection is really important, mm -hmm. really important. Um, and so when we talk about critical reflection, like sometimes after we have action reference team meetings and we have guests come in or there's new members coming into the group, there'll always be a connection. Someone will know someone. Mm -hmm. It is just that that that's the survival technique, I suppose, or the survival ways of working with Aboriginal people, you always had to mm -hmm. be connected and you always you always uh, had to have and work on those relational networks in order to survive um, in, in, in a colonial um, a space. Um, so there's always these little windows of opportunities or unexpected outcomes that we that we mm -hmm. have. And so we're also mindful to record those stories and and what happens because that's all the invisible work that happens behind the scenes. So, and sometimes that, that shifts our thinking or it might shift the way we're, we're going. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what was identified in action one was we've got four sub studies or four, four little projects. And over that project, we've started Indigenous governance and, and we've already, we're, that's mm -hmm. what we're doing now. We're working out um, and, and putting what it is we want, how do we want these teams to operate in our working together agreement. So um, Indigenous governance is, is, is what patients told us about and, and they said, um, I think these are your words actually, Rani, we are more than our disease, you know, we don't want to be looked at as just patients with, with you know, disease, mm. we are more than our disease, our kidney um, issues are, are, are a part, just a part of what we are, but we, we are strong people. Um, and then we have the kidney journey mapping um, of, of patient journeys mm. and stories. And these tools have also been used in other areas also to make visible the work that um, renal kidney managers do um, to bring people together, to have access to dialysis and to get them back to country that's not necessarily seen or, or, or ticker boxed um, uh, in, the, in the health system. Um, and then there was really important, uh, the support for Aboriginal kidney care patients. Um, you know, we know what it's like. We want to, as, as Rani said, you know, we know what it's like. We, we mm. want to create the resources and create these resources um, in, uh, that, to promote health, um, to keep people healthy, uh, and then to create resources that will help um, people who've, who've been recently diagnosed to, to work through the system. Mm. Or, uh, it's um, we know how to connect best with our people and the information that needs to be um, shared. So it's about creating resources that our people are going to pick up, read and be like, ah, I can understand this. Mm. I'm going to look into this. So it's just about being having access, them having access and them understanding uh, and then connecting. Mm. And um and so then our end goals is what we want. We want to have patients and families with better kidney care. Um, we want to have um, our dialysis and transplant experiences and outcomes to be, to be good, to be healthy outcomes and access and education and prevention um, resources and peer support. Uh, and also the health professionals um, to be able to, and which has already started to, to create and have input into um, cultural safety training and tools um, and the health journey mapping tools are, are, are primarily um, developed for clinicians but they have been used in other settings um, and so effective partnerships mm. um, and to change the way well to bring care back into the healthcare system to have to actually have input into and co-design a culturally safe models of care for for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that may look different around the country. Mm. Mm -hmm. So our progress. So um, I guess the what, what action has been able to achieve, so within the first three years, is establish those rela relational networks. And um, yeah, so just providing that space has been able to create all these networks and so the space that action gives us. Um, people are connecting in with it. And then we've been able to just connect those dots 
continue to work with our key organisational networks. And so we have within Action 2 now, we've identified all these different little groups. I like to say acronyms because <laughs> they're all their art, their act, their ask, <clears throat> all these different little acronyms that um, we're getting confused about now. But it just show it just goes to show you like how action, just that one little network of action has now become these little pockets of support um, that we can tap into, at, you know, whenever something arises, we are, ah, we connect with, we've got people in this space over here that we can talk to. So um, that's really good to have. We're now progressing the Indigenous governance structures. And um, that's been interesting to look at because whenever we come into our meetings and we're, and we're doing presentations or even the prep preparation, we're always being, things are being highlighted for us of what doesn't work when we're doing it a wood news way or the Western wood news is white person or non-Indigenous person in my language. But when we're doing it in the Western way, we come against so many roadblocks and things that just may stress us out. And then when we flip it and do it our way, it's like, ah, why can't we just do it this way in the first place? <laughs> so it's made our, you know, how we process things, decision-making process, how we see ourselves in leadership, even the confidence it gives us to be able to sit here and be in this brave space and talk about it. Like, I feel more supported knowing that I can come in here and do it our way. Um, it's more sustainable for me. It's, we're being held accountable because uh, we're coming from our perspective and there's more transparency when we're talking from our lived experience uh, and doing it our way. Like uh, I feel confident to be able to sit here and, and do it my way. So in process, we're in the process of drafting our working together agreement, um, which will help us guide our work over the next five years. And it's a living document. So it's not a document we say, okay, yep, tick, that's how we're going to work together. We know that there's going to be challenges and changes that happen along the way. And, um, you know, we know from our experience that something uh, a patient expert can have five million things happen to them in the space of 24 hours, mm -hmm. which could affect or impact how we continue to work together. So we're always mindful of the different energies that are in the space and how we cater to be inclusive of and um, highlight their, voice, their voices and make sure that you know no one is left out and that we're, we're not tracking on without people mm. so um, action croaky articles are also about to be released and uh, so we're looking forward so keep your eyes out open for those because it's going to uh, tell, <laughs> tell you a lot more about in-depth stories of of what's been happening in this space um, from a patient expert's point of view and working collaboratively collaboratively now on position descriptions of each team member. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a slow process, but it's also been quite fast in terms of, you know, when you're living in the city compared to when you're living in the country. And um, we talk about that often about, you know, the fast pace of the city and how everything's on the go all the time. And then you go back to country and you can sort of slow down and, um, you know, like take everything in and be like, oh, yeah, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, it's been good to see the progress and that we're actually making progress and that it's actually, you know, I can see how the work of Action 1 and now Action 2 is flipping the service on its head, um, which allows us to become more uh, impactful decision makers. Mm. Want to add anything to that one? No, I think yeah. you've covered that. So um, Rani's mentioned the working together agreement. So in Action 1, when we first got together, uh, it was really important. Um, and the document at the time was, I think it was maybe a two or three pager, and it was, a term, we call it the terms of reference. And then, you know, um, the team members said, oh, you know, terms of reference, let's call it working together. And said, yeah, that, okay, that's what, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had a terms of reference, and it was important to set that up with the reference team because we wanted to be really clear um, about how we were going to be um, operating or how we were going to be, how we wanted the space to be. So we talked and we had principles um, about um, discussions and the relationships. So we had, it was based on a set of principles that, um, that would keep that space safe. We also looked at the importance of having Nunga space, you know, mm -hmm. Aboriginal space, black space. Um, and that was really important because 
sometimes there's there's issues and and things that come up um, that uh, that really warrants the need for Aboriginal people just to get together and be with each other to support each other. And I'm talking about lots of sorry business. So you talk about intergenerational trauma, you're talking about constant sorry business. Um, so it was really important for us to have that space to check on each other, just to be with each other, to provide support, and then also have, you know, to the, some of the discussions um, that we needed to have if we had pushback on um, on uh, things that we'd suggested needed to change. Um, and then, and, and that was really important because, you know, when you're working in the academic space, you're working within, uh, you know, this it, it, the, the colonial system, and it, it is, you know, the system was set up, it was not set up with First Nation people in mind. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a juggle, isn't it, Ron, mm -hmm. to, to work within the system um, and then try to create change from within mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, keep, keep your own spirit strong mm -hmm. in terms of your identity and mm -hmm. where you're coming from and then managing um, all the sorry business. And that's the invisible stuff that I think a lot of people don't understand, the management of sorry business, but also the management of our own families that may have mental health mm -hmm. issues. Um, um, and so it was really important to have um, that time. So so coming into action two, we have alternate um, space. We, we, we talk to the members and say, do you want close space, open space, next one? So we're trying to alternate um, uh, when we have those spaces and, and then what, we, what people want to talk about. Um, so the terms of reference document has gone from a three-pager now because we've, we've got um, quite a few teams, as Rani mentioned. We've got mm -hmm. the action project team. So now we're trying to clearly define what the role of the action project team is. We've got art, action reference team and their role. So the whole project centres around them. Then we've got the action research team and chief investigators and associate investigators. So we're, we're now trying to make sure that we have clear definitions of each group and their roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We're looking at um, developing the principles for that. Uh, and one of the main principles um, who came up is, is a sense of humour. Mm -hmm. You can't Always. work in this space if you lose your sense of humour. That's, you know, as you said that before, and as Shilpa, um, one of our kidney doctors said, you know, humour is a superpower. If we lose that sense of humour, um, it's really hard to get back on track. Mm -hmm. So so that's one of our, um, and, you know, one of our strong principles is is that that sense of humour when when people's spirits need to be lifted, mm. um, and so this this next um, to working together agreement is a, is a thicker document, uh, and we want to be really clear on um, the definitions. If we're using cultural safety, there's a lot of definitions out there. If we're using indigenous governance, what do we mean by that? But we want to make sure that we're clear on the definitions within these documents in the context of our work. Um, and so, um, so we're working on that uh, at the moment and, and really trying to flatten that hierarchy, that top-down structure um, to a flat, more, more of a networking um, way of working. And it's interesting because when we reflect on leadership, well, what does that look like in this space? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have just one person leading this. I might, I might be the chief investigator leading this on, on paper with the National Health and Medical Research Council mm -hmm. um, uh, funding. But in, in, in terms of the project, leadership, leadership comes in different forms depending on the skill set of that person. Mm. So it's an adaptive, I think, an, an adaptive sort of leadership style. So, um, um, so I guess also the other important point with um, the Action Reference Team is we support them uh, and we've built into the budget. They have transport access to come to the meetings. It was difficult to actually get some uh, at the beginning. We have we have vouchers. We, we introduced um, vouchers as a way to be able to pay people straight away um, because of the admin system within the university. It's slow and long. Now we've got chief investigators on board. Um, Ryan is here with us. Um, so we've got contracts um, coming through and the contract I think is complete now. Mm -hmm. um, so. So our colleagues um, and the clinicians and doctors um, when we do come up against these barriers, um, we try and figure out, well, how do we get around this? How can we change this? How do we keep moving forward? They're really instrumental in, um, in, in pushing, 
pushing uh, and protecting um, protecting us in that way too. I think, mm. yeah. So um, so the working together agreement is a work in progress, and we've got uh, a closed session in a couple of weeks or three weeks time to just primarily focus on getting that document um, um, to a good decent draft stage to then send out to our groups and then workshop that mm. um, again. And our hope is that everyone will sign that document and uh, will agree to work by its terms and will give us feedback along the way about if the document works for them in terms of how we work together. Yeah, and it's about being accountable and transparent mm. to each other um, in the next five years, you know, and we, we do work, walk on shifting ground um all the time so all the time yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> COVID's just well made it that way made it even, made it even more challenging <laughs> and so did you want to yeah this is so this is a team that we're working with together over the next five years and this is people that we've worked with in action one and continue to work with in action two so in action one the renal patient experts began as reference group members and there was only one Indigenous chief investigator, Dr. Odette Pearson, and there was intended to be two, uh, but it wasn't possible in the end. So, yeah, um, in action two, there are now four Indigenous chief investigators, including three renal patient experts, which is, you know, a pretty major thing for us. Like mm. when we're told, oh, you're a CEO, we're like, what does that What's even that? mean? What's what a chief that investigator? Mean? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, so the kidney doctors and nurses, managers and experienced researchers in Action One have moved to a support role and associate investigators, uh, which means that it's it's really top heavy led by Indigenous experts, people who live live it, breathe it, we know it, we are it. And you know the strategies that need to be put in, in, in need. Um, mm. And so, yeah, you know what needs to happen. Um, but I guess uh, I guess having you know people sitting in positions of power like Stephen McDonald and Shilpa and um, um, and other mm. other nurses uh, who can make some changes and sometimes some of the changes um, that need to be made is is, is just a communication problem. Mm. Um, and you can even see just in that little um, slide there just how you know, action one, how, who the leadership was, and then you look at action two, and what we wanted from action one was that Indigenous leadership, Indigenous voice enshrined, you know, that self-empowerment, self-determination. Mm. Action two clearly shows that this is Indigenous-led, this is Indigenous governance, living, it's a living Indigenous government, governance, mm. so... So we're working it out as we go along as well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and it's going to, you know, we, we, we always, we, you've always come up against issues and, and challenges, but um, it's really important that we're we're able to sit openly and, and talk about things. But I think to to have that um, black space for our research um, researchers and also for for the uh, kidney patient experts is really important. It's a, it's quite a supportive space. So watch watch this space in the future. Um, it's uh, it's certainly uh, interesting times for us. And when when we sort of look at well, what is it about this this brave space? What, you know, what's what's the energy about this space? And what does collaboration look like for us? And where do we want to go with it? So we we would like to leave you with this poem. Um, and this is really summarises um, how we're trying to hold that space and work uh, in a collaborative way. So this is an invitation to Brave Space by Mickey Scott Bay Jones. Together we will create Brave Space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world, we all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world, we amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. And side by side in Barkadji language means we kara. And I often say we work on it, we kara away side by side or alongside each other. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd like to leave you with that poem, but we'd also like to leave you with 
this picture here. Yeah. Oh, that's that's really like, we like to take lots of photos yeah. as a way of recording our work and, and documenting. So this is most of our action team and how we work. Uh, and once again, humour is our superpower. So we, with our photos, we always do like the serious, yes, this is us working, we're doing it. We're, we're, we're actually working. We do the formal And then photo. we do our silly one. Um, so we just, we go a bit crazy in some of our photos. But in this photo, that's me on the computer screen. I wasn't able to make this action meeting because I was um, actually just had a transplant. Are you going no, 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 this is pre-transplant. So I was getting yeah, ready to go she, in. She's in the hospital next door, getting ready yeah. to go in. So I'm getting ready to go in for transplant in this photo. And um, all, all the guys are like, you know, supporting and still making me feel like part of the team with the power of technology, which is, um, yeah, we love, we love using technology for humour. We do. <laughs> and that's Sam Bateman on the left there, standing up behind uh, on the left. And Sam's um, one of our um, nephrologists, kidney doctors. She's amazing. She's doing a PhD. She works closely with Kelly in, the, uh, in front of her there in the brown shirt. Um, and Kelly uh, is the National uh, Indigenous um, Transplant Task Force uh, Coordinator um, with Shilpa. And, um, and then we have the beautiful Kate um, on, on the right side of Kelly uh, at the back there. Kate's now, work, now working on the APY lands um, with, um, and she's been there for, did we get that job earlier this year? Earlier yeah. this year, yep. And then we have the, the amazing Nari um, sitting in front of Kelly there in the wheelchair. That's Nari. She's a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. um, and it was Nari, it was Nari, Nari and, and Inna, Inna Inna Winchie sitting to the right of, um, standing to the right of um, Nari. So, These two, yeah, yeah, that actually um, were the first to start um, the reference team, mm. really. Um, and Nari's um, Nari's been known to to yeah run down uh, politicians in her wheelchair um, if she's not satisfied with the answers she receives when she asks questions. And then you've got Janet Kelly on the right of Inawinchi, myself. Donna um, is a mum, single mum, and Donna is the cousin to a young. Uh, member we had that we lost uh, a couple of years ago mm. and then you've got Jared who's also on the right there that's had his transplant is this coming up or his, October his coming up November November so he's he had two years his, yeah okay yeah, it's two his years. two year anniversary in November mine is in two days my one year anniversary for transplant and I think when's Kelly's um Kelly's is oh sorry day Sorry, so that's Kelly sorry. got her transplant on Sorry Day, which which has become her happy day. Um, I'm sorry, he's a kidney. Yeah, I'm sorry, he's a kidney. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So so we try to celebrate um, the transplant days and birthdays, and as you can see, we always like to try it. We like to have fun. This was a particular day where we had a our action uh, reference group meeting, and um, everyone was wondering where where Rani was. And so uh, there were, Kelly was on her way to pick up Rani and Kelly arrives at Rani's door in early in the morning and says, come on, Rani, you're ready to go to our meeting. And Rani's going, I've got a kidney. And so, and Kelly just thought that um, it was a kidney um, art piece that, um, that Rani and Jared were working on, two mm. kidney art pieces using the plastics from the dialysis machines. Mm. And Rani was actually saying, I've got, I've got a kidney, I've got to go to the hospital. So halfway, I think halfway on the on the road, um, it just no, she Kelly like, pinged and said, oh, my God, what? You've got a kidney. So then Kelly took Rani straight to the hospital. And then we're all sitting here waiting, oh, where's Rani? And then, of course, oh, it was just an amazing day. Mm. It was mm. funny. Anyway, so that's, um, that's, us. that's us. That's the presentation. And we're open to have any questions um, from anybody. Oh. Thank you for having us. Oh, I've got a friend here. Hi, Brooke. <laughs> wow. Yep. Here we go. I went to school with Brooke <laughs> in Port Augusta. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we're Hi, Rani. To look at our comments here now. <laughs> okay. Oh, do I go stop share? Hey, how do I do that? What are you doing? Um, oh, stop share. Okay. There we go. Okay. Is that it? Oh, okay. There we, we go. Great. Oh, so, look yeah. at Kelly. Oh, this is lovely. Wow, I can see everyone there. Yeah. Nice. So, um, thank so you. Alison, do you feel, yeah, we'll take you back, give you back to Alison. Oh, just, just to say thank you so, so much oh, for inspiring Baby presentation and sharing your important work and your stories. We do have a bit of time for questions and we can stay online a bit longer. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and we'll have a look at those comments on the side. What we do that, 
I noticed, Emma, a little while ago that you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Emma. Me, Emma? No, no, I have no hand up. I don't know what I was waving. Ah, okay. I beg your pardon, Emma. Okay. All right. All right. So we can open that open the uh, up for questions. I think Scylla had a hand up, Ali. Yeah. Okay. Scylla. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. That was such a wonderful presentation. Um, I love the renal empowerment voices finally being being um, created in such a space where patients, a group of patients have a lot of power. Um, I've been in the renal space for a long time now, first as a volunteer. Um, I was a diabetes health worker at Wachopran, but as, as your reference group will actually find out that, you know, there aren't a lot of support systems around nationally. And if this is the beginning of something big, which it sounds like, um, I'm definitely really, really supportive and 100% behind you guys. Um, I've been on dialysis now for nine years, um, was up for a transplant, but that's another story. When I have a long time to have a yarn with you guys, I will tell you about my stories. Um, just in relation to your cultural bias and policy report, um, is that just about racism? Because we've we've had a big racism report here in Queensland and that was done in 2017 and it's just going into the hospital government system now for Quake, our, our national peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control, to try and work with Queensland Health to disseminate some of the barriers that we find in the hospital systems. Um, and when you narrow it down to the renal space, um, you know, I think it's, it, it is about empowerment and the way you learn that is about, for me personally, is asking questions. Um, and I, that way it, it, it empowers me. I mean, I've got a Masters of Health Research all about renal disease, um, where I work with 12 renal patients in Brisbane, but I've worked with hundreds of patients nationally around Australia on impact, on impact study, um, looking at barriers to kidney transplants for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But I think the renal space, wherever you are in Australia, it might be good in some areas, but in some other areas, it needs a whole shake up. It needs nurses to have cultural training, cultural competency, respect for patients. Um, you know, when you ask them a question about when you see an Aboriginal lady getting needled 10 times up her arm, then you speak up on behalf of that patient. What's your needling protocol? Um, and the nurses challenge you, and I just I just find that really disturbing because if you're not looking after your, our own mob, how how on earth are these non-indigenous nurses looking after our mob on the machine? Um, so there's you know there's a, there's a whole gamut of areas I think in the clinical space as well that we need to challenge people on, and through your reference group, I hope some some empowerment comes of that where they can challenge the tertiary system and feel strong about it. Um, so I'm very interested in, in, your, in your whole work and your, and your partnerships that you've, you've, you've developed and the work you've done on Action One. So great work and um, yeah. So yeah, that was just a little question about your cultural bias and policy report. I do encourage you to get that published as soon as possible so that way some governments can start to, you know, have a look at the outside picture, you know, just not from their tertiary world and their clinical world where they come from, where the patients are always wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Scylla. Yes, um, the cultural bias report, we were um, under quite um, a lot of pressure to complete that uh, in December last year. Mm. Um, when we were asked to, to do the report, um, it, um, it was around cultural bias. And so we, the first discussion we had was, well, what do they mean by cultural bias? Um, for me, I, I just sort of thought, well, is, is that, is that a, another warm and fuzzy word for racism? Mm. Um, is, that, is that, you know, so we have, we've, we've had lots of circular discussions, but 
That report um, is now, um, and that was funded by the Lowell Institute. So we are awaiting um, that to be released. Um, the um, National Indigenous um, Kidney Task Force have responded to that. And, um, and so we're, we're hoping that'll be released in the next couple of weeks, but there's certainly been pressure by the Lowell Institute to, to put it out there because that does have a policy report and it does have recommendations um, and lots of uh, lived experience and stories. And needling was, was certainly um, one of those stories, Scylla. Yeah. Uh, so that came back again to the reference team uh, mm -hmm. for further discussions. There's quite a lot of recommendations in there. And then that was narrowed down to, um, to the top, I think it was top six or top 12 recommendations that um, the reference team wanted uh, government to take note of. So hopefully uh, that'll be out soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have some other comments or questions? Okay. Yes, so it's, it's Megan Passy here. I work at the uh, UCRH in Lismore. And I was just wondering if when that report comes out, if you're, could you circulate it through the Strad network? Because I'd be really interested to read it. Mm. Assuming it's you know free to be distributed, <laughs> and it, it'll be released. Uh, it'll be put on to the Lower Institute website as well. Um, but yeah, we'll send it. Oh, don't you worry. Sure don't you worry me. We'll be sending that all around the country. <laughs> and I wanted to just say too, we do have a, an international um, connection on, in action too. Um, we have. Uh, one of our chief investigators is uh, Josée Lavoie, and she's worked with First Nation peoples in Canada um, for over 20 years and uh, has travelled around Australia and has done some work here as well. Um, so the First Nation communities are also really keen to see um, 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 the update of the um, health journey mapping tools, but they're also um, quite keen to, to be looking at that report as well. So we do share resources um, with First Nation peoples. There's also an international... Um, a team that we meet up with as well uh, on a regular basis. And at the end of the day, there's so many great resources and there's things that people are doing that we should be sharing. Our culture is, sits on the foundation of sharing knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and, but it sort of butts up against that, you know, that, that, in, that, that this knowledge is mine and, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. my intellectual property right. It's, it's, it's quite interesting um, managing that space um, as well. But yeah, look, we're happy, we're happy to share whatever resources we have um, uh, and, to, and to meet and talk further with others um, about how we're doing things. Mm -hmm. um, did you want anything else to say there about that, this round? No, you got that one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we'd be very happy to distributing things through our network that would be just fantastic to keep in to, you know, to be able to do that kelly did you have a you have your hand up thank you kaya from perth um i just wanted to, to let everybody know basically the update with the cultural bias report katie's online she's our next senior project um officer but the microphone isn't working so we're just letting you know that there is a release happening in November and next steps and that we can distribute to anybody who would like it. But like Kim said, it's on the Lowitcher. It will be on the Lowitcher website as well. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do we have other questions or comments? Just one more for me from Cecilia. Mm -hmm. um, just in regards to your change model of care, doing dialysis in the, in the hostel, um, how did you go about that and get the funding for that, given it's, I mean, are the patients uh, not acute patients? They're quite stable, so they're able to stay, I mean, do their dialysis at the hostel without a um, medical team around or a nephrology team around? How did that come about? Because that's really interesting. That's a really interesting model. I feel like it started with like conversations around having a one-stop shop for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients coming into the city from country and accessing a service or a place that was culturally safe oh, and okay. they didn't have to go here, there. And so this was a constant challenge and story that kept coming up in our initial conversations. 
And so we started to sort of connect some dots and think about, well, okay, how can we make an immediate impact and change in this area? So, and then we just started to just think and talk about it. And then it led to. Yeah, so look, I, I don't, I'm, pro I'm probably, um, I'm probably going to ask Janet Kelly, um, mm. colleague, you there, Janet, you can hear us. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Janet Kelly to, to talk to, to this. Mm. So it, because Janet um, she really led that. originally started, um, we'll, we'll sort the funding uh, in the early days. And, um, and I think through the clini clinical uh, connections with staff um, that Janet had, um, did you want to talk to that, Janet? I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah, I can. And this is this feeds into what Kim and Rani were saying before about bringing all the people together. So we had the really strong community voice that identified this was a really big priority and it came out of all the consultations, the journey mapping, all of our meetings of the reference group. Meanwhile, the renal services were also looking, they were really concerned about what was happening to people from um, remote areas and people were missing dialysis and they're getting really sick and there are emergency admissions. So they were crunching their data and building a business case. So these two came together and then Stephen McDonald, who we talk about, who arranges dialysis, Stephen did a lot of that really high level work because to have the dialysis um, set up, they had to negotiate across two different local health networks, which sounds easy, but is actually really difficult. So he did a lot of that behind the scenes work. So it was a coming together of all these groups and then the hostel manager, the Aboriginal managers who wanted to know that community were really behind this. So he came to the reference group meetings and said, well, if we do this, how do we, how do we explain to community who will actually get access to this dialysis? And I remember, Rani, you know, you mob, you said, that's okay, we can help explain this. We can help explain those people who most need to have dialysis here because they are the ones who are really struggling in, in Adelaide at the moment and they're missing dialysis and they're getting really sick and then they get put in the ambulance and taken to the hospital. So all these different things came together and that's what made it work. And again, like we, we talk about that importance of the space and having that space because we wouldn't have heard the stories about this need without the action space. So again, the importance of creating space to hear the stories is something that we really value and that we try to continue with action too. The other thing um, we do, Scylla, and it, and it just, I mean, it happens, like sometimes, um, I'll give you an example, um, if you don't mind me using it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, Rani may have family members that have just been diagnosed um, with end-stage kidney disease. And so she might give give myself or Kelly or a, a call from you know and say hey so and so is in the hospital, and we're just right next door. Can you just go and check on him uh, or her? Um, just just go and be with them. They've just been diagnosed, uh, and uh, and so it's not uncommon for us to for for us to go. Okay, yep, we've got this. So we'll go over and be with patients. Um, you know, prior to COVID, um, but also you know when we can, and so. So that's the sorts of things that 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 happen as well, um, and that's that invisible work. There's also other situations where um, a member may have experienced, um, um, you know, what they mm -hmm. what they what they see as, as racism or stereotyping, uh, and uh, rude clinicians, um, and they'll give us a call and say, well, you know, I've just I'm just trying to get this happening. This happened to me. This is what this is what happened, and so we can then Janet. Uh, and or perhaps Sam could then make a call, or or uh, then they they they'll be able they're able to step forward and go. We've got this. We're going to you know find out what happened, and so so that's the I guess that's the support from the clinicians um, and um, other uh, colleagues. So it's that you know as as, as another um, colleague said you know. Um, Pennies, it's just like working in this space. It's like, well, you're knowing when to step forward, knowing when to walk alongside, knowing when to step behind. And that's the kind of um, actions that we juggle uh, in this um, at the interface. So, you know, there's times where I might raise an issue, but it'll just, you know, it may just look like, oh, here we go, another black woman whinging about something. 
Whereas we we think a bit more strategic strategic, we go, okay, well, I think this is this we're going to have a better outcome if you raise this issue, Janet, or or someone else raises this issue. And so and so that's that's what happens. Um, so someone else, you know, our, our our colleagues will raise a decision, and that's that's kind of how we we manoeuvre and work within the system. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? I was rabbiting on a bit there. I just tend to rab it on. I <laughs> when you get the, you when you you get the platform, I you rab it on. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think this is rabbiting on, Kim. This has been a, it's a fabulous presentation and with so much wonderful learning and sharing. And thank you very much. Are there, are there other questions? We've, I know we've gone over time, but I think as long as people are, sort of have things they want to talk about, that's fine for us. Um, are there other questions or comments for Kim and Rani? Ah, there's a hand up over there. Just Janet here again. Um, Silla, I realise I didn't answer the other half of your question, which was <clears throat> around the how the dialysis is set up in Kangawadli. So there's um, a nurse allocated there and I've had Aboriginal health practitioners and a nurse work together. And there's a nephrologist who's allocated um, to that clinic as well. And she often does remote clinic. So she is from um, already... She already has a relationship with a lot of the people who go to Kangawadli because she's already met them out in their home country and when they come down to the city. So there's quite a wraparound. And during COVID, um, the Aboriginal hostel were making sure there was a lot of other services and the local Aboriginal primary health care service. Like there's a lot of wraparound all coming together around people. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. Okay. Well, we, we probably regretfully should wind up now. It's been absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you. Great opportunity to talk about this and really important work you're doing. And um, what I'm going to do now is just hand over for Karen, to Karen, who's going to talk a little bit about the follow-up and um, 